down. We're doing a little break from the usual schedule of doing Nintendo Power Retrospectives at the first of the month and following up with a bunch of Breaking All Down. And also, for that matter, my schedule for the the Yakuza Papers reviews. Because we have opportunity to be topical for once. In this time where I'm going to be talking about Civil War in time for the release of Captain America Civil War. In particular, I'll be talking about the Marvel Comics Civil War event. This is a comics event which is very controversial. I mean, most comics events are, but Civil War was a little more so than others. Due to how the series attempted to, for lack of a better term, try to do a Shades of Grey story with the Superhero Registration Act, and how it ended up being a lot less Shades of Grey, and how certain supervillains and superheroes were executed, both literally and figuratively, in terms of the narrative, and all these other various factors, well, a lot of things worked which... Well, a lot of things didn't work which should have worked, or or could have worked, or just generally could have been done better. Which is... Ultimately... The tragedy of Civil War as an event is how much of Civil War has been undone. And it's an event which could have had some long-term, some real long-term, still actively effective repercussions on the Marvel Universe and comics. And a lot of these points were things which had to be backpedaled and rolled back on because they were executed so poorly, because they had characters making decisions which were out of character, grossly so, and ultimately really led to issues down the road, which other writers basically had to backpedal on to a certain degree. With the Marvel Cinematic Universe take on Civil War, there is the potential, perhaps, to get it right this time, to have the characters be better done, to have the debate be better realized, and to have the points handled better. So that in mind, I want to give my five points about the Civil War, Civil War as a comics event, where things could have been done better, and if things were done better, it could have been improved, and particularly what those things were. Not just in terms of oh, what needed to be better, but what the improvements needed to be. As with all of my lists like this, they will be done in no particular order. Some things which would probably be my number one change will be done given a little earlier on the list, some of the things which are perhaps a little lower in priority will be coming up earlier. So, with that in mind, let us begin. This will be Talking Head. I will try to put some images over here to illustrate my points. Number five. Let's do five to one. Ascending or descending or whatever. There's directions. Right both sides attempting outreach. There was the attempt with the series um, Pulse, which was covering the media, how the media viewed the Civil War as an event, to cover some points there. But one of the, I guess, one of the problems with doing trying to do a, a event with nuanced politics when you're dealing with superhero comics is people come to superhero comics to see superheroes fighting to a certain extent, and. I almost feel, to a certain degree, that Civil War as an event would have benefited more by the core book be people sitting down talking, and the side books be people fighting, as opposed to the other way around. Or perhaps an equal split of talking and fighting in the big books. And the talking being as much about debate about debate and outreach and engaging with the public and explaining why the Registration Act was bad if you're on the anti-reg side or explaining why it's good on the pro-reg side than just talking plans of action among, and trying to recruit heroes on one side or the other. Because ultimately, as far as the pro-reg and anti-reg sides are concerned, the only way things are going to change is not by getting Iron Man to change his mind, or Tony Stark, or um, the Fantastic Four, Reed Richards, to change their mind, change his mind, or getting 
any of the other heroes on the pro-reg side to change their minds. It's getting the politicians who enacted the law, getting the voters who elected those politicians to change their minds. That's ultimately the way, one way or the other, to change things in the course of the event. And having more points of the story where Cap, or you, you had Cap and, and later Spider-Man and uh, Power Man engaged the public explaining their side of things, or perhaps through their legal representation, be they um, She-Hulk or the law firm of Nelson and Murdoch, to get across, to, to get these points across and engage the public relations to say to the public, hey, having r this information accessible or available or even just stored for who superheroes are in real life is not necessarily a good thing. Plus, there's a few other points which I'll get into in the later portions of the event where things could fall apart. Number four. Supervillain involvement. We have, in Civil War, we had some supervillains siding with the anti-reg side. And we had supervillain involvement and, and stories related to supervillains tied to the um, storyline with um, Reed Richards' new Negative Zone prison. And to a certain degree, I believe there was some Thunderbolts involvement as a group of as basically a super team working for the pro-reg side hunting down anti-reg heroes including some of their fellow villains that's a start but there's a, I think there could be a lot better ways to handle this if you're actually trying to get nuance on this issue SHIELD is the group responsible for storing the Superhero Registration Act database basically and S.H.I.E.L.D. is perhaps, in Marvel Comics, not necessarily the most infiltrated group in the history of Marvel Comics in terms of authority organizations, because most conventional intelligence services have been in, perhaps infiltrated more. Plus, most mutant hunting organizations usually have been heavily influenced and infiltrated by strikers, purifiers, or that sort of thing. So where some interesting narrative potential could come up would be, for example, in the X-Books, there's the Purifiers that have been sort of recurring antagonists since Josh Whedon's run. And even actually a little before that with uh, Claremont's revived Extreme X-Men, where we got God Loves, Man Kills 2. Having groups like the Purifiers, who have an anti-mutant agenda, getting involved with the pro-reg like pro -reg side, not necessarily because they actually support registration, but it gives them a chance to attack mutants, it gives them a chance to attack, perhaps even in humans, under the auspices of working with as a representative of, law, of the law, of law enforcement. This is actually something that happened during Prohibition in parts of the country where, for example, the Ku Klux Klan got deputized to enforce prohibition, leading them to attack Catholics because they use wine in the sacrament, even though prohibition actually made an exception for sacramental wine, or attacking minority communities which um, had consumption of alcohol, or focusing on minority groups which were involved in um, producing a moonshine, or home distilling, or brewing. Or just for that matter, attacking these groups as uh, the auspices of law enforcement and framing them for possessing alcohol. A bit which has happened considerable amount in the war on drugs. Anyway, well, not so much the deputization of the Ku Klux Klan, but framing minorities for possession of narcotics. So, using this and taking advantage of the use of mutants and now the Inhumans as a surrogate for minority groups and using this as an opportunity to get into 
law enforcement persecution of minority groups or law enforcement discrimination against minority groups that just creates a certain degree of potential on the pro-reg side for shades of gray and to a certain degree kind of vil tends to be more on the side of villainy from describing that tends to be is villainous from describing but it gives them a chance to have some gray on their side and on the anti-reg side getting in dealing with the villains who just want to wreck stuff or might act that they are sympathetic to the anti-reg cause but have significant baggage in their background where it is questionable to whether or not it is worth having them on your side. Like, as an example, Kane Marco, the Juggernaut, Sabretooth, various other X-Men villains. This is actually going to lead into my second point, or number two on the list. But having very questionable supervillains who you can't just necessarily kill easily and whose abilities might be of use to the anti reg side, on the anti reg side, it also gives them an actual real shades of grey there, where Cap has ends up being forced to make strange bedfellows or be strange bedfellows with characters who he would not otherwise be willing to work with. Him. The Thinker, for example. Number three. Spider-Man should not be pro-reg. Spider-Man, perhaps one of his defining traits as a character, aside from with great power comes great responsibility, is his dealing with fear of what happens if his rogues gallery, if his, en if his enemies discover his identity, going all the way back to the death of Gwen Stacy. Now, to a certain degree, depending on which version you're at, There's the question of whether Norman Osborn actually knew that Spider-Man was Peter Parker, but the whole issue of Spider-Man identity being out at all opens up a whole bunch of cans of worms. And additionally, one of the protagonists who Spider-Man now has kind of had a long-standing acquaintance and friendship with, close, like this twin's more friendship and close friendship with, is Daredevil. And Daredevil's history is pretty much a long-standing line of here's why you don't want your villains to know who you are. With perhaps the sole exception of Elektra, who was killed not because Bullseye had knew conclusively that Matt Murdock was Daredevil, but because of the later vi loved ones in Matt Murdock's wife's life suffering because of this knowledge in particular Karen Page. It's certainly a situation where Mur Murdoch and Spidey knowing each other and being friends creates a situation where Matt Murdoch would be the first person to tell Peter Parker this act is bad news. I don't have to tell you my life story to pr prove this to you. You were at Karen Page's funeral. That should be enough to make this clear. If this could happen to Karen Page, this could happen to Mary Jane. This could happen to Aunt May. This could happen to Felicia Kyle. This could happen to any other important person in your life. This could, hell, this could even happen to J. Jonah Jameson or Robbie... Thompson at the Daily Bugle because they are close to you and they're your friends and you care about them and you're Spider-Man. And yes, Peter Parker's an Avenger at this point. Yes, Peter Parker has also sort of been taken under the wing of Iron Man, of Tony Stark at this point. But there is a certain degree of yeah, I've got the help of the Avengers. But that also means I have the enemies of the Avengers now. And while certain members of my rogues gallery may go, I'm not going to make this personal. And certainly, if Doc Ock or the Vulture discovered that Aunt May was a family member of Peter Parker, they would not mess with her because of because of Spider-Man, 
because as much as they hate Spider-Man, they've also had a soft spot and an off-and-on relationship with Aunt May, and probably if they met again, there's probably still a certain degree of friendship there, even if their relationships did not work out due to supervillainy becoming an issue that tends to put a cramp on things with other people, with normal people, relatively, at least in the Marvel Universe. And hell, if somebody killed Aunt May or tried to take Aunt May because she's related to Spider-Man, it is also entirely possible that you might have, and I'm surprised we didn't get this when Aunt May got shot, Doc Ock and the Vulture coming in and saying, hey, we'll help you get the bastards. Because we care about Aunt May too, even though we, we broke up, we're no longer a thing, we care about Aunt, care about Aunt May. So there's that. And well, if it was even if it was Mary Jane who got shot, Craven would probably like, hey, I I don't like you, Spider Man. I want to take you down. But they screwed with Mary Jane. They, they they killed Mary Jane or tried to kill Mary Jane. I hate that more. That sort of thing. Even though yes, Craven and Mary Jane, Craven's relationship to Mary Jane is kind of a creepy soccer relationship. Still, we'd get that reaction from Craven, I think. So there's that. So the logical, and I realize that people aren't logical, pe aren't, aren't logical beings, but under the circumstances, looking at the scales, things are weighted on towards the side of, if you look, if you lay out the facts and you lay out the circumstances of Peter Parker's life and the lives of the people he knows and how their secret identities and the issues they were into with their secret identities have con dealt with each other, weighs more on the side of saying no to registration as opposed to saying yes. Because Peter Parker has plenty of experience being on the run from the law before as Spider-Man. However, frankly, his family has less experience of being targets of Hydra of AIM, of all sorts of nasty, nasty groups of people because they're the significant others of Spider-Man, because they're their family, they're the friends of Spider-Man. Number two. This is going back to the event directly before Civil War House of M. And basically, don't do decimation. Decimation was a thing kind of pushed down the pipe by Marvel Editor-in-Chief Joe Quesada based on the fact that he felt that there was an oversaturation saturation of mutants in the Marvel Universe. That the mutant side of the Marvel Universe had become such a thing that it couldn't really exist on its own anymore, but it also, which also creates baggage for other writers who are trying to do their own things in the Marvel Universe on the street level side, on the, the regular superhero side. And by doing decimation, it makes being a mutant special again. It makes... The thought was that the that if you have the minority population of mutants smaller, the minority narrative for mutants works better. And I, I disagree on this fundamentally. Because the thing with minority populations is... Yes, there's less of them than the supposed majority group, but there's still more of them than you think, depending on what part of the country you live in. I mean, obviously, if you're living in the Southwest, you'll be encountering a larger Hispanic population than you would if you're living in Idaho. Months well, Idaho, but or Montana, or North Dakota, or northern Minnesota, for example. But... Minority populations are there, and the prejudices that these that these populations encounter are a bigger deal, and the minority discrimination analogy or mutants persecuted minority analogy works better when there's a number of when you have enough of a number of of this population where you can see these are the pop. See these these various levels of discrimination in action. Pulled over for driving while mutant. Um, a 
mutant with visible powers or a visible mutation ru- is running and a cop assumes they're criminal and shoots them. Discrimination in the workplace or in casual street interactions based on mut- and being a mutant. Casual use of anti-mutant slurs. That sort of thing. It's bringing up these incident, these incidents that come up in life works better when there's enough mutants for people to view those, to, to develop these persecutions and for the audience to see these prejudices in action. Not just against our heroic X-Men, but against other mutants. And consequently, when we get into Civil War and the SHRA, we then get to the issue of uh, the uh, of how that act works in relation to the larger, long-running anti-mutant prejudice narrative in the X-Books of stuff like the Mutant Registration Acts that have been bouncing back and forth in Marvel Comics ever since the 1970s, perhaps even earlier in the 60s, and how those interact with the world and how characters interact with that. And thus, in turn, how mutant kind and the X-Men as a group react and whether they go pro or anti-reg. We could we could get things like Professor Charles Xavier testifying before Congress in an X-book actually kind of pushing against that, pushing it back hard against this. We could have stuff like okay, we're going to have Hank McCoy do appearances on talk shows talking about the Registration Act, what it's like being a mutant, and dealing with what how this act would affect him and other and not just other X Men, but other mutants. We could get into stuff in particular with characters who've come from dark fu- dark dystopian anti mutant futures or futures which are bad for mutants, like Bishop, like Rachel Summers, if she's back at the time, like Cable, to a certain degree Cable's in a more apocalypse controlled future, and have them look at the situation and worry about, okay, I think I prevented the particular details of my future, but this doesn't mean a future like mine can't happen. This event could be leading towards my future. What do I do to stop it? What steps do I take? Do I go full anti-reg? Do I sign up with Cap and fight? Do I go pro-reg in the hopes that if mutants pick the right side on this... I'll go on the Perreg side, they'll get an easier easier break. Do we do we try to sit this out and hope things settle out and work out okay if we just shut up and not do anything? As it stands after decimation, because mutant the population of mutants is so small, what happens in the X-Books is the X-Men go, yeah, we're out. There's too few of us. We can't risk this. We're out. This is doubly kind of bad because one of the things we're, that's missing from the X-Books of this time period, or character-wise, is Magneto. At this point in time, Magneto is dead. And as one of the founders of the Brotherhood of Mutants, and as one of the big characters in the X-Books saying, Hey, Xavier, they're going to turn on us, and we have to be ready when this happens. As the line goes from X-Men 1, what happens when they come to your school to take you to take your children? Having Magneto be a part of this, having Magneto the character be active in say active in being anti reg, and perhaps I mean, he be the face of the anti of the anti reg mutants, and be the one coming to Cap saying, "I am here to assist you," or Mag. Or now, Captain America, Magneto stands with the anti-registration forces or something like that. We would have this different scope of things where it's not just, oh, we are it's just powered people versus uh, just do the powered people. It's, now we have a situation of people who are born a particular way, who are born with abilities Perhaps some which make them better or stronger or faster than other than ordinary humans. Others which maybe are less practical, like some of the stuff with the Morlocks. 
and having them be in a situation where, okay, how does this registration act act these affect these people who don't necessarily want to be superheroes in the first place? They have perhaps superhuman abilities, but they are not superheroes. They don't want to be superheroes. What does this do to them? And having that discussion be a thing that can actually happen in depth is, I think, something that would improve this, the Civil War event tremendously. Because at this point, Marvel hadn't gone, we're going to use the Inhumans as our new discriminated minority allegory. They're still sticking with mutants on this point. And this leads to point one. Probably the biggest issue that I have with Civil War. One of the things that could affect, like, the changes that could have affected so much and evened out the tone and allowed for perhaps the more nuanced tone story that the Marvel editors wanted when they came up with the event in the first place. And that is, write out the Superhero Registration Act. To explain, I've got to give a precedent for what I'm talking about. I play tabletop role-playing games, in case you couldn't tell from my videos about tabletop role-playing games and recommendations. And in the tabletop role-playing game space, this game called Shadowrun, a cyberpunk fantasy role-playing game. In, like, the 80s, 90s, uh, at the point during the meta plot, there was a presidential election that was run, and one of the candidates running in it was a great dragon named Dunkle Zahn. Dunkle Zahn won the election and then died in an apparent assassination attempt, and after this, there was the reading of Dunkle Zahn's will. The will was actually read as a event at Gen Con, and a source book was published covering the will called Portfolio of the Dragon, or Portfolio of a Dragon. And it gets into the text of the will and a whole bunch of crunch and flavor text related to the bits outside of the will. And the events that happened triggered by this assassination and who inherited what set up a score of meta plot things which lasted for an incredibly long time in Shadowrun, and some of it's still playing out to this day. Because of this, the text of the will, plus inline commentary through the Shadowrun message board called um, Dump Shock, where discussing various points on the will and people going, oh crap, that's a big deal, oh man, and oh, that's kind of silly, or whatever, are all put in there. And they get into, oh, there's bits other than this in the will, that this is the important portion. So allowing GMs to have other little bits that they want to include to reflect their own campaigns. And they put this, the text of the will with this little shadow talk com, with the shadow talk commentary on the webs, on their website available for free for anyone to read. If you wanted the more standing up of some of the people involved with this, of the foundation created to carry out the wishes done in the will, you had to buy Perfoy the Dragon for that, but you got the text of the will. Anyone who's playing Shadowrun, players, GMs, have the text of the will, so when it came to source books that were playing off that, or their own campaigns, they know what the players and GMs are on the same page with what's going on, and everyone knows what to do. And knows, okay, here's what's going on, how does this affect things. Everyone is working from an even level starting point playing field on this point. Everyone's fully informed, pretty much, what's going on. If you write out the text of the Superhero Registration Act... You write out, okay, what is the act, what does it do? Even if it doesn't really look like an actual law, as you, as what most of us look at if we go and read the text of a bill that's going through Congress, or your local ballot measure to amend your state's constitution, even if it doesn't look like that, everyone knows, okay, what does the Superhero Registration Act mean for people who are born with powers but don't want to be a superhero? What does the act mean for people who don't have powers but want to engage in superheroics? What does the act mean if you're... if... in terms of training and support and that sort of thing? Who handles superhero information? What happens in the event of a breach? That sort of thing. The term what the bill says and how the bill works and then put it out there so everyone knows it. All your editorial staff and all the readers. Because at the point that Civil War came out, 
comic books and popular entertainment in general, populist, popular entertainment in general, popular and populist, was getting much more involved with the internet. We were starting to get the dawn of viral marketing, where we got stuff like the, the viral marketing bits for Cloverfield. Even in some of the tabletop role-playing game spaces, we had some viral marketing materials coming out with some tabletop role-playing game books. And so because of this, this was the perfect place to go, okay, everyone's on the internet now. Everyone's got a browser. Everyone's got an internet connection. Let's take advantage of that. Let's do a website promoting a Civil War event before it starts, perhaps during the road to Civil War, where the act is being debated and it hasn't passed yet, and people are trying to figure out what side they're going to be on, but the actual conflict hasn't started. And we register marvelcivilwar.com. And on the website, you have a rundown of what books are going to be part of the event, what books are part of um, Road to Civil War. You have your store finder, so you can know where to find the books. You have a checklist or whatever. You can go in and you can hand it over to the guy and say, I want these books in my pull box. And it has on there all the little links, all the little tabs on the top. Read the act. And you click on that as the text of the act. Perhaps you could even do, like, have the text, and then have little side bits of perhaps a little, a couple little in-universe, in-character things referring, referencing the act. You have an editorial piece from the Daily Bugle by J. Jonah Jameson, whether he endorsed, about him endorsing the act. You have an editorial piece from Charles Xavier with his opposition to the act. That sort of thing. You have a quick discussion of the arguments for and against it and what the act is. If the fans don't want to read it, they don't have to read it. But it's there. They know what the act is and and entails, so you don't necessarily have to give the full text of the act in the course of your event. And all your editors and for individual books and all your writers know what the act is so they can write it accordingly and plot for it accordingly. So... If the act says, hey, you're not going to be a superhero, I'm, I'm sitting things out, I'm good, and somebody does that, and the act says, okay, then he's actually good, we're not going to arrest him, even if he had been a hero previously, then you don't have a situation where the, where the character steps back, and then in their own book later, S.H.I.E.L.D. busts in and tries to arrest them, like what happened with Luke Cage. We, ha we have this commonality. We have this point where the writers and the characters know what's going on. And everyone's on the same page. And the readers, if they want to know what the act is, they can get that. That's, and that way, the story is evenly paced. And you can do the Shades of Grey right. Where, yeah, Cap's anti-reg, but the act is written... Maybe it's not as bad as he thinks it is. And you have a little commentary on the website, or perhaps as a back page thing in a Spider-Man comic, with J. Jonah Jameson saying, Hey, this act isn't as bad as you think it is. On the other hand, you have Tony Stark, full-throated endorsement of the act, but as a reader, you go, mm, maybe there's some issues here that you aren't, that you're dismissing and not giving their full consideration. And then you have not just characters saying this in the work, but you have perhaps on the website the article from, mm, written in character by Charles Xavier, with Xavier saying, you know, there's these other issues we have to worry about that make this act troubling. If we got those points, if these points happened, Civil War could have become, gone from a story that once it ended, everyone was trying to retcon away. Everyone was trying to get rid of in one form or another. Whether it's during Dark Reign, having Tony Stark steal the Registration Act database and ultimately get delete it so that it stays out of the hands of Norman Osborn, thus effectively making the act moot because there's no registration database. Or having to have events like One More Day, no, um, 
brand new day with Spider-Man's identity coming out, Aunt May getting shot, and Spider-Man taking dramatic steps to restore his secret identity for the safety of his friends and family. We wouldn't ha necessarily need to have those difficult points, but we'd have other points that could last longer term and create new narrative ideas. You have Luke Cage, who steps back, says, I'm out, and he's left alone. And he's watching the sit when he's watching things play out on television, like he says he will, and he's watching his friends in trouble, and he has to come to the point of, can I just sit here and watch my friends go through this without being a part? Because oftentimes, when it comes to civil rights things, there's the, there's the old question of, how long can you sit on the sidelines and watch bad bad shit happen? before you have to stand up and do something to stop it. That sort of thing. We can't get moments like that because it's not so much a nuanced story as an all-over-the-place story. Having the act written out in its entirety, or in the, not sorry, in its entirety, in a fairly complete form that spells out what it is, and puts all the writers in the same place, makes things less all-over-the-place and more figured out in a cohesive structure so that interesting stories can be told within this structure. So, those are my five points for how the Civil War as a comics event could have been improved. If you have any other points, which I did not bring up, which you think would have helped, or if you disagree with my points, please, please post in the comments. Please be civil. And if you've seen Civil War, the film, and want to get into spoilers, please don't. I'll probably do a video or something about a month at, like, like when, when I see it, but schedule it for a month after the films come out to give some wiggle room for people to go sit down and see the movie, either in a first run or a second run theater. And then the, dis the spoilerific discussion can be then. So, until next time, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>